So we know our typical, you know, normal sinus rhythm. I think we're all by and large familiar with, uh, you know, EKGs that, that look like this. But, you know, when we, you know, break it down into its components, we have to, you know, remember to keep in mind when we're analyzing EKGs that there are really kind of, uh, you know, three main waves that we look at, the P wave, the, the QRS complex, and the T wave. Uh, and then kind of the main intervals that we're thinking about by and large from like, at least from a pathologic perspective is the, uh, the PR interval uh, here and also the QT interval. Um, so, so then, we, you know, when, we, when it comes time to analyzing an EKG uh, or, you know, a rhythm strip, uh, we kind of want to keep some of these things in mind. And I'll talk about one way that I usually think about kind of, um, you know, systematically th looking at EKGs so we don't, you know, miss anything, you know, big, bad or ugly that needs to be followed up. So, you know, usually uh, looking at EKG, probably the, you know, one of the major things to look at are some of the leads that are at the bottom of the EKG. And some might recall that, like, that basically gives you 10 seconds of, uh, of an EKG. Um, and uh, this allows you to kind of uh, pick up findings that, uh, you know, you can see on a B2B basis, basically. Um, and you're able to, you know, confirm or corroborate some of these findings by checking the other leads, of course, on the, on the EKG. Uh, so sometimes a longer rhythm strip can be helpful in this regard, but uh, sometimes you can get all the information you need from, from EKG. So, you know, one way that I sometimes think about typically looking at EKGs, and this is actually the way I personally do it, honestly, on a, you know, whenever I see EKGs, so I don't, you know, hopefully miss anything that's, um, you know, pathologic or that's going to necessarily require, uh, you know, consulting a cardiologist or sending proponents or additional workup. So rate rhythm axis is kind of the, you know, the way that I learned it. And so you kind of look at for axis, you're looking at leads one and AVF to see if those are both in the positive direction. If so, it'll tell you it's a leftward axis. Um, the rhythm, by and large, you're looking at the at the P waves, which I'll talk more about in a second. And rate, um, you know, more or less, you can kind of look at the upper left hand corner and kind of uh, kind of see what the rate is there. There are some other ways you could potentially elucidate that as well. Um, you know, looking at the P waves, uh, the the major question here is there one before each QRS, and uh, you know, the best way I typically find to to look at this is by, again, by looking at that 10 second strip that you see at the bottom of the EKG, because that'll give you a view right away if you could see those P waves. And if you don't, then you're thinking more along the lines of AFib, which we do see quite a bit in a lot of our patients, which you know can have some real implications for how we treat these patients, of course. Uh, look at the QRS complexes themselves. Do they look normal or abnormal? And typically abnormal, I'm talking about like, does it look wide? And if it does, and you're thinking along the lines of, you know, well, could this be a left bundle branch block, which can be synonymous with a, uh, an MI. Uh, sometimes it's also a large in QRSs can tell you that maybe there's uh, an arrhythmia that's starting from the ventricles. Um, and so th that's kind of another thing that I look at. And then I kind of look at the intervals. So again, going back to the, you know, the PR interval, uh, which could give you an idea as to, uh, you know, the presence of, uh, um, block, which I'll talk a little bit, a little bit more in a few slides. Uh, the QT interval, obviously, which, you know, I know gets discussed a lot because that can have uh, implications for, uh, you know, consequent um, going into arrhythmias that could, uh, you know, really have some dire consequences for the patient from a hemodynamic standpoint. Uh, and then the last thing I typically look at uh, systematically, are there any you know, obvious ST elevations or depressions. And obviously those are red flags and you're typically looking for, you know, uh, what I typically look for is, is there an elevation, you know, one or more uh, tiny box above what the PR interval look like? And do you see that in two or more consecutive leads? Uh, so just to talk a little bit more about some of the arrhythmias themselves and kind of the ways that, you know, I myself or, you know, maybe, uh, you know, folks sometimes were in the ICU that were thinking about it, you know, sinus tachycardia, I know it happens a lot in a lot of our patients. The definition, you know, is heart rate greater than 100. And what I kind of wanted to emphasize here is, you know, I was taught pretty early on that this is uh, usually a secondary condition and by large, that's usually true. And so what, you know, sometimes is honestly one of my pet peeves is when people come in and they see this 
you know, sustained heart rhythm about, about 100, 110 or something. And the instinct is to, you know, whip out the metoprolol or something like that to try to make the number look better. And in reality, what we should be doing, especially if the patient is hemodynamically stable, is we should be really thinking about, well, what causes sinus tachycardia and how do we treat that? Because that's normally what will help address the, the problem on a, on a long-term basis, not kind of just you know, willy-nilly kind of treating the condition. Again, unless the patient's, you know, acutely decompensating. So we're all kind of familiar with, you know, EKGs that kind of, kind of look like this. And, you know, we see the obvious fast heart rhythm here. And down at the bottom here, again, if we're looking at, again at, you know, lead two, which is typically the bottom 10 seconds of it, it's even hard to make out P values here, but, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, allegedly they are <laughs> there from, from the example that I took from, from the web here. Uh, probably if, if this EKG were to be slowed down, we'd see them. Um, but what are we, what are some things that we think about? And honestly, this is kind of the list that I kind of start thinking about when I see a patient with sinus tachycardia. So a lot of our patients, there's, uh, you know, pain and anxiety type issues. A lot of them are volume down, uh, you know, sometimes after surgery or if they've gotten, you know, mannitol or something like that. Do they have a, a fever or are they septic? That's also something to kind of keep in mind. Um, they're, you know, at the back of our minds, especially since a lot of our patients have problems with their mobility, we're thinking, uh, you know, could, could there potentially be a PE or DVT? And I know a lot of us kind of uh, think about that as, you know, a, a bad news bearers type scenario, but that's, you know, definitely, some, you know, part of the differential that we kind of think about. And so, uh, you know, sometimes I even think about, you know, other issues with their um, bowel or bladder, or they, are they having trouble, you know, excreting from either one, because sometimes that can cause um, issues for patients too, and cause them to be uh, tachycardic as well. And then it's kind of some, you know, other possibilities that can, 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 can kind of uh, come up as well, including hyperthyroidism. Um, we can also do this as well, honestly, to patients. So, uh, and I'll be discussing, this will be kind of a theme in this talk as well. There's a lot of iatrogenic stuff we do to patients that can cause some of these issues. And, you know, most of the time it doesn't really have much clinical consequence, but we do have to keep in mind that there are like are a few medications that could cause, uh, you know, potential issues for patients, especially if they're used not in moderation. Um, so bradycardia, like similar to sinus tachycardia, uh, I feel like we usually have some time to like think about it. Like, I know, you know, sometimes we get all concerned when we start seeing heart rates in the thirties or, or sorry, excuse me, like the forties or fifties or that sort of thing. But, you know, if pa the patient's hemodynamically stable and there's really, you know, no obvious, you know, clinical symptoms, uh, you know, I think, you know, the better part of valor is you should try to think about it a little bit first and then to, to treat, you know, sometimes as a temporizing measure, particularly, you know, when it gets busy in the ICU or that sort of thing, you know, particularly when it was a fellow ordered the, you know, the atropine or pacer pads at bedside just in case, but most of the time these folks uh, by and large can get into trouble. Um, and so we kind of see our EKG here, you know, obviously much slower than the EKGs we're looking at in the past uh, or in the past few slides anyway. You now we see our normal sinus rhythm here again. Um, but, you know, usually when I, when I'm thinking about sinus bradycardia is you, it's usually one of two things. One, the patient's either young and very athletic, and that's why we're seeing low heart rate or two, we did it to the patient by giving them something like a beta blocker. And so those by and large are usually the two main things that I think about. And then there's kind of also other, you know, things that can sometimes come up, uh, you know, some of these like tachybrady type syndromes, do they have hypothyroidism? Do they in fact have an underlying, uh, you know, MI? Though usually, of course, you know, we typically see the ST elevations or depressions with that. Is there like an electrolyte abnormality? And so, uh, you know, of course, uh, we think about uh, Cushing's response as well. Uh, so, uh, so these are other sorts of things that can, uh, that we can kind of think about as well with regards to sinus brady. So again, trying to address some of these causes rather than trying to whip out necessarily a medication to try to, you know, gross the numbers, uh, to, so to speak. Um, and then just to speak to some heart rhythm as a, you know, we kind of see it pretty commonly in ICU and how do we, how might we think about them or is there, you know, d different things we could think of to, to uh, treat them. Uh, so AFib, as I'm sure we've 
her, you know, loads and loads of time is characterized by an irregularly irregular rhythm. And what that means that the, the, that there's no obvious P waves is, as I was discussing earlier, and there's a pretty variable ventricular uh, rate. And actually, as we get older, unfortunately, that rate increases. So unfortunately, it's a non-modifiable risk factor. Um, so as we could see in this rhythm strip, and I think I have an example here too, particularly if you're looking at, you know, our friend lead two again here at the bottom, you see that variable ventricular array with the QRS complex is occurring at different times, and then you fail to pick up on any P waves, and that's kind of your, you know, synchronon that it's likely, uh, you know, likely atrial fibrillation, and of course. Um, you know, there's some things to, to think about when we're looking at AFib, you know, a lot of, a lot of our patients already, uh, you know, have it, they come in with that uh, diagnosis, you know, we see a lot of vascular uh, cases, obviously, at our center, or they come in with a stroke, and at some point, we see that they have AFib, and we're like, ah, aha, so that must be the, you know, the cause of their, uh, you know, their large vessel occlusion, uh, but, you know, it's usually a good form to uh, investigate if there's, you know, a particular cause or has anything set off this, uh, you know, AFib, like, you know, have they recently had a, you know, a large surgery per se? Did they actually, is there some ischemia present? So we should, you know, send off a, a quick troponin. Is there an electrolyte disturbance? Um, you know, once again, could they have uh, hyperthyroidism? Uh, you know, are we doing it to them from, you know, from giving them some sort of medications? Uh, and then in terms of, you know, management, and obviously we want to treat some of the underlying stuff that I just talked about, but, um, you know, in terms of rate or rhythm control, like, you know, you know, what I was, you know, taught long ago is if, if something is, if a rhythm is really kind of sustained over that 120 to 130 mark for a period of time, that's when you kind of need to, you know, start thinking a little bit more seriously about, you know, whipping out some of these, you know, pharmacologic uh, tools, especially for, for AFib. And so, uh, you know, usually the, uh, you know, two main go-tos that typically think of are uh, ivimetropolol or DILT, including like a DILT drip, for instance. Um, and then kind of, you know, other types of medications that can be used are amio and DIG. And just to speak on that a little bit, um, you know, it used to be kind of the name of game for treating AFib was rhythm control. Uh, and until there were like a study or two came out basically that showed that uh, outcomes were same regardless of rate or rhythm control in AFib. And and I think rhythm control as a first line has kind of fallen maybe a little bit out of favor, particularly since we all get concerned a little bit that if we rapidly convert the patient back to normal sinus rhythm, that the patient will have a, have a stroke. Um, so that's kind of the way that I typically think about it. And then, you know, you're thinking about uh, anticoagulation along, you know, uh, at some point uh, along the lines, uh, especially if the you know, the patient isn't, hasn't just had surgery or has some sort of coagulopathy that would bar them from having that type of uh, medication. Um, atrial flutter, like, has some similarities um, in terms of etiology and management as uh, AFib. So this is kind of, you know, I'm sure a lot of us you know, recall this, this, uh, you know, the sawtooth pattern where the length of the circle corresponds to the right atrial size. And so it leads to this very predictable atrial rate, which is typically, or can get up to 300 beats per minute. And so it's caused by this re-entry circuit, basically in the right atrium. And the ventricular rate is determined by the AV conduction ratio, the most common being a ventricular rate of 150 or a block of two to one. Um, and uh, a flutter with a one-to-one -one conduction, which I don't believe I've ever seen actually, it can lead to hemodynamic uh, instability and uh, progress to uh, VFib, which is obviously bad. Um, you know, so usually higher degrees of AV block is usually due to medications or heart disease. Um, and then, as was mentioned, the management and kind of overall the, um, the causes are very similar to, to AFib as well. So here's our kind of like our three to one block, kind of the illustration has nicely pointed out how to, how that was, uh, you know, determined. We see the sawtooth pattern here. And again, is another example. I think of this one is of like a two to one uh, block that we could see here. Um, and then uh, just to speak a little bit about the uh, blocks them, 
themselves uh, sort of for uh, in terms of a uh, bradycardia uh, perspective. So, you know, first degree AV block is defined as abnormally slow conduction through the AV node, and this leads to an, an, a prolonged uh, PR interval, which we'll take a look at on one of the next slides. And so, you know, generally speaking, it doesn't uh, really cause any hemodynamic disturbance or seem to affect conduction really in any way. So no specific treatment is required. And so, you know, cardiology will generally not be, uh, be super impressed with this, uh, with this heart rhythm. But, you know, if you, what, what I find typically easiest to be able to look for uh, a prolonged PR interval is to kind of look for a QRS that kind of lines up with one of these large, uh, heavy lines. And then, uh, if the P wave basically falls in between there and the next heavy line, then you don't have, uh, you know, first degree AV block. But in this case here, you have the QRS that lines up with this heavy line here. And then the P wave here is all the way over here. So, you know, well past, well past that big box, if you will. So, um, so that would, we, we would define as, uh, as first degree AV block. Um, and just another example here where, where again, we're seeing the P wave that's, uh, that's longer than one of the big, uh, big squares. So when we're thinking about first degree AV block causes, some of them are, uh, you know, similar to the causes of sinus bradycardia that we were talking about earlier. But, you know, once again, we have to kind of keep an open mind as the possibility of could there be some sort of underlying cardiac etiology that we kind of um, need to address and look out for um, and possibly manage as well. Um, and again, there's not really any specific treatment uh, per se, and it can be a normal variant that can come up every so often. Now, secondary degree AV block, as I'm sure some of us kind of remember from, you know, thinking about some of these, uh, you know, uh, rhythms, we probably remember fondly the Mobitz 1s and the Mobitz 2s. So Mobitz 1 is this, uh, uh, as you might recall, progressive prolongation of the PR interval culminate, culminating in a non-conductive P wave. And so basically the PR interval is longest before the drop beat and then shortest immediately um, afterwards. So you have like your, your P wave, it progressively, uh, you know, this PR interval here, right? It progressively gets longer and longer and longer and then it drops. And so it kind of gives you almost like a little warning sign as to uh, that this is about to happen. And this is generally thought to be due to reversible uh, conduction at the level of the AV node. So, you know, the AV node tends to you know, progressively fatigue until it fails to conduct. Um, and uh, to be honest, I would say that a lot of cardiologists aren't usually super impressed with this rhythm as well. You know, a lot of us, you know, myself included, sometimes get anxious with looking at this rhythm because you certainly also don't want to confuse too much Mobitz 1 and Mobitz 2, you know, which as we'll discuss is a, is a little bit more uh, dangerous. But, um, in any event, you know, Mobitz 1 causes, again, a, a lot of it can be iatrogenic, which is kind of a common theme here, um, increased vagal tone, and again, looking out for some of these cardiac causes too that we don't want to miss either. Um, so then, you know, then we have Mobitz 2, uh, which is just uh, where you have P waves uh, that get dropped, but where you, you don't have the, pro the progressive prolongation that PR ripples, you don't have the warning sign, as you might remember. So you have the P waves um, that kind of, uh, you know, march at this certain rate, the same rate, and then, you know, without warning, you have this, you have this dropped beat. And, um, uh, this is just another example there too, that there's kind of this, just this random, and here's two beats in a row where the, uh, where the QRS complex was just totally dropped. And so this is usually more typically due to structural damage moments too, um, you know, fraction fibrosis, narcosis, you could see it on the slide there, you know, failure of conduction at the level of the his Purkinje system, which is below the AV node. And, you know, again, there's a slew of causes for this potentially as well, but, you know, this is kind of the generally the one that we start to get, be getting a little bit concerned about and, you know, cardiology starts to be getting, getting a little more concerned about and, uh, you know, that we kind of want to address. And certainly by the time you get to third degree AV block, which is, you know, also known as complete heart block, now we're, you know, now we're really getting concerned. And I, I don't actually know if I've actually seen, maybe I've only seen one, one or two cases of this, but, you know, it's characterized by no AV conduction, right? So there's no uh, talking between the atria and the ventricles at all. Um, and so you're basically seeing the, 
uh, the atria and the ventricles, you know, marching to their own drum, so to speak. And here's a nice picture where they've kind of outlined how the P waves march across the screen here. And then the QRS complexes are kind of doing their own thing. And the QRS is, you know, comes from the ventricles as mentioned before, the P waves coming from the, uh, from the atria. And then this is another example too, where if you like march it out, you're kind of able to kind of sort of see kind of the P waves kind of probably mostly in this T wave here, and then probably again here, and you can kind of keep marching your way out here of these P waves that are totally independent of the, of the QRSs. Um, so this is really a high risk for, you know, for bad, bad things happening, ventricular standstill, sudden cardiac death. Um, and so it's typically the end point of second degree heart block. And so we're looking at pacing and probably a permanent pacemaker as well. Um, and so we're similar etiologies here. So um, give it a time and so forth. I won't belabor monomorphic VTAC and other things so much, except to point out a few things, especially since I know a lot of us have done, um, you know, ACLS and that sort of thing. So monomorphic VTAC, just to point out that this is because it's monomorphic, you're kind of seeing the same complex over and over, which is kind of why that's called that. And obviously that can be uh, you know, uh, not, not a gar good heart rhythm uh, to see in our patients that needs to be acutely addressed, um, can impair cardiac output, degenerate to uh, VFib, which as a lot of us know, no identical P waves. So I'm just moving through quickly here. Um, and you get that, you know, because you're not able to contract in a synchronized manner, you get immediate loss of cardiac output. Um, it can progress, uh, honestly, all the way to asystole. There's, a, you know, a slew of causes, as we know. Um, you know, generally speaking here, if we recall our H's and T's from an ASOS algorithm, that's mainly what this comes from and what we need to think about. Um, just to point out quickly, torsades. So you can probably recall this is twisting around the points. Um, and, uh, you know, this is where we, we get concerned about the QT inter interval. This is kind of where that, you know, um, that uh, concern that we, you know, I started talking about at the top here kind of comes into bullet to play. And what is the consider the first line farm treatment of torsades? It's magnesium. If, if we all remember that it's magnesium. So we kind of see the twisting around the one point here, for instance, on, uh, on this EKG or this uh, rhythm strip, for instance, and there's another example there. Um, the commonest cause of polymorphic VTAC and tracades, uh could be uh, MI, but again, there's you know, QT prolongation. Um, and honestly, uh, you know, we tend to think of just to, to, to recall, you know, usually we're thinking about a max value of around 500 for a QTC, so the C meaning corrected for the heart rate. And so 500 is generally what we're thinking about. We start to get a little bit concerned about, uh, you know, that maybe we might be overdoing it with one of many medications that we could potentially give these patients as these patients can get a lot of these QT type prolonging medications, particularly, you know, in the ICU, you know, we, I highlighted some of the major ones that patients tend to get, such as just some of these antipsychotics, and then you add on some of these antidepressants or some of these other medications, such as methadone and antibiotics, and you've got yourself quite a milieu that could be concerning for the patient. And this is where your, you know, friendly neighborhood pharmacist, of course, can come in handy to make sure that you're not going to go too astray with too many QT prolonging uh, medications. And then uh, finally, just a couple of quick points here, cerebral uh, T waves. So I'm not sure if anybody's seen an example of that. I had a good example in my previous job, so I decided to include it in this uh, presentation. So characteristic of raised intracranial pressure, as we know, uh, classically seen in uh, massive ICH, um, and but similar, you know, EKG patterns have been seen in other things as well. So this is, you know, an example for some of my patients, you see these large, deep inverted T waves in this patient. Uh, you see the reciprocal here in some of these leads as well. And uh, this was like, uh, as I recall, an 18 year old. And I think he, think he just had a, a fairly significantly large um, uh, tumor with a fair, a fair amount of uh, necrosis and edema. Um, and then, you know, just wouldn't feel like I completed an arrhythmia talk without acknowledging STEMI, of course. We already talked about uh, new left bottle branch block being sometimes a synonym for that. And we recall that, you know, one or more 
leads in a row with uh, you know a uh, QT elevation above one small box is typically kind of what we can get concerned about here in this particular patient example. There's at least three leads in a row that are of great concern for that. Um, and then just briefly to acknowledge the ACLS alg algorithm, which touches on some of the same points I already talked about, but you know, first we recall our shockable and non-shockable rhythms, asystole PA being in one category, VFib and polymorphic VTAC being in the other, um, you know, epinephrine being one of our main go-to uh, medications. Thinking back to our uh, H's and T's, which is paramount to thinking not only during any sort of code, but afterwards, assuming that we regain ROSC and need to address any causes that, that pertain to why the patient coded to be begin with. And then, you know, as I was talking about earlier, you know, when thinking about bradycardia and tachycardia, you know, really it's thinking about is the patient actually symptomatic for this? And if so, then you kind of start one of whipping out your drugs and your pacing and, and that sort of thing. Otherwise, you kind of, you know, watch, wait a little bit, you have a little bit of time, same with the tachycardia, once again, is it symptomatic? Do we have some time to figure out or not? And then if not, then you're kind of resorting to your cardioversion and, you know, other, um, other potential cardiac expertise. So, you know, after CPR or some, you know, significant event like that, you're obviously thinking about post-resuscitation care up to including hypothermia, which could be its own lecture, you know, revisiting the HOTs, as I mentioned, and of course, uh, you know, looping in the family. You know, if, and if any doubt, you know, calling a cardiologist, I think when I was uh, an intern, we were still uh, faxing EKGs. <laughs> and now we all have uh, smartphones and, you know, Epic Chat, and uh, it, it makes it a whole lot easier if there's ever, uh, if there's ever any doubt. Um, and so these are some of my 